everyone enjoyed your splendid meal. We welcome you to the afternoon session on day one of ISOCON 2016. Now, we have a talk by Dr. Robert Briggs and we would like to invite to the dais the chairpersons, Dr. Ram Das, senior ENT surgeon from Chennai and Dr. V. Anand from Polachi. Good afternoon, delegates. We are going to start the session now, afternoon session. After a heavy lunch, I think everybody is feeling drowsy. I think we will wake up because there is a, a good talk by Dr. Briggs from Australia. Well, may I request Dr. Briggs to come and give his talk? Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. It's a uh, pleasure to have this opportunity to present to you again. Uh, this time a sl sl somewhat different topic. Uh, acoustic neuromas is another area of interest of mine. And uh, I was fortunate to spend uh, a year at Los Angeles at the House Group doing a clinical fellowship. And it's from that basis that uh, since 1993, I've been doing acoustic neuroma surgery in Melbourne. Uh, but things have changed quite a lot in the, in the meantime. Um, we have a better awareness of uh, the natural history. Uh, we diagnose the tumours somewhat differently. The management options are changing, but interestingly, the surgical side of things hasn't changed a great deal. Um, so we have a better understanding about the role of hearing preservation and restoration, and management of NF2 is also changing. In terms of the diagnosis, uh, clearly, Audiologic invest investigation of patients who present with the unilateral tinnitus, hearing loss, uh, vestibular disturbance, etc. It still uh, relies on pure tone audiometry, speech discrimination. But the reality is that in Australia at least, screening ABR is very, very rarely done. And it really plays no role in the investigation. Uh, at least uh, I only get ABRs done once the tumours are diagnosed and we're interested in predictive factors. Instead, MRI scans have completely uh, revolutionised the way we assess these tumours. And a combination of T2-weighted imaging, uh, with or without gadolinium, uh, allows very accurate diagnosis. For example, here's a very small lateral tumour, which with gadolinium enhancement uh, is confirmed to be a schwannoma. Um, and on the contralateral side, there's, of course, a bigger filling defect in the internal artery canal, and that enhances consistent with a patient with neurofibromatosis type 2. So the combination of uh, T2-weighted screening and um, uh, routine audiometry is really the mainstay for diagnosis. In terms of the natural history, there's been a lot of investigations and publications and variable reports from um, showing 18% don't grow through to 100% of them do grow. But it's... Uh, well recognised that perhaps the average growth is around two millimetres a year, uh, but, uh, the, uh, but that bilateral tumours tend to be associated with faster growth, growth than unilateral. In a literature review of uh, 41 patients, pa papers uh, in relation to tumour growth, I think it's important to note that there's no reliable predictors that are identified for tumour growth. So we can't tell in advance what, what's likely to happen. The mean growth varies. Uh, whilst the average might be two to four millimetres, sometimes it can be fast. An occasional tumour shows quite rapid growth. And cystic tumours uh, tend to enlarge faster than solid tumours. <clears throat> Everyone will be aware of the Danish series, and Sven-Erik Stangerup from uh, Copenhagen has published extensively on their uh, observational studies. And 
To summarise, those tumours that are in the in within the internal artery canal, only 17% will grow within five years, whereas the extramiatal tumours, nearly a third of them, will show growth uh, over a five-year period. And what, also, what else they've noticed is that the hearing gradually deteriorates whether or not tumour growth occurs. Late growth after a, a period of uh, no obvious growth is, is very unusual, but it still can occur. And if a patient has good speech discrimination, in particular 100% speech discrimination, then that's associated with a better prognosis uh, for, for, for both surgery and for other treatment modalities or even observation. So what are the treatment options? Well, clearly we can simply observe the tumour and repeat the uh, imaging to see if there is enlargement on follow-up. We can do surgical removal, which can either be attempting to preserve the uh, hearing or as a non-hearing preservation operation. Stereotactic radiation can be delivered uh, either as a single dose or as a fractionated treatment. And more recently, there's perhaps a, a role for combined uh, planned surgical debulking and follow-up stereotactic radiotherapy. Although in the majority of cases, I think we'd like, we might do some surgical debulking and wait and see if there is growth that occurs before giving radiotherapy. But I think in the United States, this is a more common procedure. So the Danish uh, management algorithm was that if the tumour size at diagnosis is uh, greater or equal to 1.5 centimetres, uh, or greater than 1.5 centimetres, then that meant they should be treated surgically and they went for operation. And in their hands, that was invariably a translabyrinthine removal. For those that have smaller tumours, they would do an MRI scan after one year, and if growth was demonstrated more than two millimetres, then they would either send them for radiotherapy or surgery. And those that aren't growing, they would do MRI after two, three, four, five, seven, nine, 14 years. So long-term uh, follow-up imaging. But it's interesting to consider that in the Danish series, it's all tumours are referred to the one centre. Uh, and the Danish Acoustic Neuroma Society in fact, mandated observation. So they weren't given any choice about offering uh, different treatments for the smaller tumours, and that can be an issue. And they also have limited experience or, or even success with hearing preservation surgery. So they don't do middle fossa surgery, and they don't do uh, uh, retrosigmoid surgery. So that, again, influences the outcome, and I don't think that's uh, ideal. And also, despite being close to uh, Sweden and uh, where Gamma Knife was developed, they had limited availability of stereotactic radiation. So who should we observe? If you uh, have a patient, then I think that all patients who have tumours where there's no immediate risk, then it's worth considering initial observation and a repeat scan. But that's clearly going to be very dependent on what the tumour size is, what the age of the patient is, and what their hearing is, both in the ipsilateral and in the contralateral ear. So someone who's got a small tumour in an only hearing ear is a very different scenario to someone who's got a large tumour and good hearing in the other ear. So we've got to very carefully consider the overall situation. And we have to consider their overall health and general comorbidities. And I think the other thing we must consider is that if you're going to observe someone, then if tumour growth does occur, it shouldn't have a significant impact on what the final outcome of tr any treatment would be. So we don't want to be seeing a transition from uh, a, a tumour that might be surgically removable and save the facial nerve to one that puts the facial nerve significantly at risk. So who should be observed? Well, clearly if you've got a little tumour like this or like this, there's no question that initial observation should be uh, done and uh, repeat the scan in uh, 12, probably 12 months' time. Whereas if it's a tumour like this, it's a bit larger, but it's still well clear of the brain stem, uh, filling the internal canal, slight projection into the cerebellar pontine angle, still very suitable for observation, uh, but it would also be very suitable for surgical removal, it would be very suitable for radiotherapy, although you note that it's getting quite close to the cochlea and the radiotherapists 
who are honest will not say that they can treat that without risk to the cochlear. Um, so I would think initial observation is again reasonable, but perhaps you might want to do it at six months rather than 12 months, because if it was in fact growing quickly, you're better to identify it early rather than uh, later. And here it's bigger again, but not still clear of the brain stem, but still very reasonable, I think, for observation if that's what the patient prefers. But again, they would be very suitable for either surgical removal or radiotherapy. Whereas this one is now contacting the brain stem, um, but there's a CSF cap lateral to the tumour in the internal tree canal, so that's a favourable thing for surgery. Um, and again, I'd be a bit more inclined not to be, or to be offering active treatment rather than ongoing observation, unless the patient was very keen to continue to have it observed. Whereas in this situation, we've now got a little bit of brainstem indentation by the tumour, and this, at this stage, I think active treatment is appropriate, and to, to recommend observation is perhaps putting the patient at some risk. Some years ago, uh, one of our audiologists, in fact, reviewed uh, 95 of my patients who had been observed, some of whom had been observed for up to 10 years, and if we look at, at zero is at no change, uh, what is notable is that some of them do shrink over time on repeated imaging, and some of them do show uh, significant growth, and, uh, there's, but the majority are basically unchanged. Of those patients, uh, continued obser observation was discontinued for whatever reason, either increased hearing loss or the patient wanted surgery or there was demonstrated growth in 24%. Tumour growth more than two millimetres was demonstrated in 23%, but the hearing was stable in, in the majority, 73%. But as I said, uh, observation doesn't necessarily mean hearing preservation. This is the audiogram of a, a man in 1999 had an eight millimetre tumour. He's got some high tone loss in both ears. But in 2010, he's still got an eight millimetre tumour, hasn't changed at all, but the hearing has dropped much more significantly in the tumour ear than it has in the, uh, the uh, non-tumour ear. Stereotactic radiation uh, is now widely available and, uh, and is very popular for tumour management. And the, the claim is that they have a high rate of tumour control that they have a high rate of hearing preservation and a low rate of adverse events. And the stereotactic radiotherapy is, is a way of focusing the, the radiation and avoiding hopefully local side effects to other areas and can be de delivered as a gamma knife or a linear accelerator. And the one is a cobalt-60 source and one is a photon beam source. But my radiotherapy colleagues tell me that there is no difference. It's basically exactly the same treatment outcome. And so I think the claims by one or other treat treating group that their treatment is better is uh, not correct. That's the linear accelerator uh, system with a, 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 a non-relocatable frame. And here's a, a more modern picture of the gamma knife system. And they get very nice uh, pictures of the tumour and uh, the isodose regions around the, the treatment and uh, they, uh, I'm confident that they can deliver pretty accurate treatment but I think also not always. We've seen episodes of geographic miss for the treatment and uh, it may not be quite as precise as the pictures would indicate. And certainly complications can occur. The hearing loss is uh, often the case and they typically get some vestibular dysfunction as well. Facial neuropathy also occurs, and the concern that really puts the radiotherapists off is trigeminal neuropathy. And so for larger tumours, they're very reluctant to treat, uh, particularly three centimetres or greater, largely because of trigeminal and brainstem uh, potential dysfunction. Hydrocephalus has also been reported uh, relatively frequently and sometimes needs shunting. I think malignant transformation, although it's reported, is really exceedingly rare and is, is not really a reason to be not treating. Um, but in young patients, radiation tumours elsewhere are a much bigger concern. And post-radiotherapy meningiomas, for example, occurring in, in younger patients is, is a potential problem. 
And in Melbourne, there's been one patient die after stereotactic radiotherapy because of intratumor hemorrhage uh, in a patient uh, who then had to be anticoagulated for a DVT. And this is a patient with hemifacial spasm that came on after uh, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy. So this is two years after the radiotherapy. And um, I think Jacques obviously needs to be decompressing the, uh, the, middle, the, the, the posterior fossa in this case. But there's no question that <coughs> radiotherapy can be effective. And uh, I don't like to think of it as radiation surgery. It is radiation therapy. And here's a one, uh, two years initial uh, size, and then two years after stereotactic radiotherapy, there's been very significant shrinkage. And this was a patient who was not fit for surgery because of bad liver disease, and so a very good outcome in this case. Um, and here's another lady who had a this size tumour in her only hearing ear, and uh, seven years after the radiotherapy, there's been very significant shrinkage. And by this stage, in fact, she's had a cochlear implant in her other ear where she'd had a previous temporal bone fracture. And the implant was done with the magnet removed so that she can have good follow-up imaging of both sides. But here's another patient who, 20 years after single-dose treatment with stereotactic LINAC, uh, he'd not, he's in fact a GP, a general practitioner, had no follow-up imaging, and he presented with increasing ataxia and psychiatric disturbance. And you can see he's got a very nasty uh, lesion involving the cerebellum and the cerebellar peduncle uh, with some sort of necrotic uh, brainstem and, or, or cerebellum and tumour. And here's another more recent patient who uh, had uh, presented with this tumour, and uh, he actually had a small... Uh, AVM in his cerebellum, so we were a little bit reluctant to recommend a retrosigmoid surgery for him. And uh, he had radiotherapy. Then 18 months later, he's got this cystic uh, enlarging tumour which was starting to cause some brain, brain stem contact and compression. So what is the role for stereotactic radiation? Well, I think for, if you've got a documented enlarging tumour, uh, in other words, we don't want to just be treating every patient who should be observed. All of those patients with small tumours and uh, good hearing, they should be observed. They shouldn't have reflex radiotherapy. Uh, so in a documented enlarging tumour, if a patient's unfit for surgery, then clearly radiotherapy is preference. If they don't want surgery, that's uh, a good reason to, not to. If it's their only hearing ear, then perhaps fractionated radiation is, is a safest way to try to preserve hearing. And otherwise, if they're relatively elderly, small tumours with useful hearing where an operation is likely to lose hearing, they're better to have radiotherapy. But for younger patients, <coughs> I think microsurgery is better. Uh, but clearly, <coughs> excuse me, it comes down to patient preference. It, it, patients need to be making the decision because there is no clear-cut answer as to what is the right treatment in many cases. Some, some cases... Uh, there is no place for radiotherapy at all. It can't be used, and uh, so uh, all of these are obviously amenable to surgery. So surgical removal remains the definitive management, and we aim for total tumour removal, but with a preservation of neurologic function. But in some cases, there is a role perhaps for brainstem decompression and partial removal, being and, and then trying to preserve facial nerve function. Sometimes the facial nerve is so attenuated that it is impossible to uh, completely remove the tumour and be confident of preserving facial function. So in those cases, leaving tumour is a reasonable option. And perhaps, as I said, it can be combined with planned stereotactic radiation, but I would prefer to do that only if there was demonstrated growth of any residual tumour. I do think that Surgery for acoustic neuroma should be done as a multidisciplinary team approach. And we have a combined neurotologic and neurosurgical team and use tra the translab retrosigmoid or middle fossa approaches depending on the, the tumour size and situation. And I think ideally we need a dovetailed subspecialty training approach. And so I'm very grateful to Andrew Kay, the neurosurgeon that I've worked with for over 20 years. Uh, but now we have uh, Claire Azaley, who's a junior ENT surgeon, and she comes along to all of our cases now, and uh, hopefully in the near future I'll be able to step back and she can take over my role. And Andrew Kay has a, neuros a younger neurosurgeon doing the same. And I don't think there is any place for the occasional acoustic neuroma surgeon. This is a subspecialty 
problem needs to be referred to uh, experience, experienced subspecialty services. The big challenge is the facial nerve, and <clears throat> in my experience, over uh, over now over 750 cases, the, the outcome is directly related to tumour size. If you have an intracanalicular small tumour, then we can be very confident about saving the facial nerve. But if you've got a bigger than three centimetre tumour, then the results aren't, aren't so good. And uh, whilst I think nearly 70% grade one is still excellent, some patients are going to have significant disability in terms of facial function. Which approach do we use? Well, the translabyrinthine approach is really the workhorse approach, and we use it for patients who have any tumour size that have basically poor hearing. If we can't, if there's no hearing that's not worth preserving, then the translab approach is the preferable approach. But if you've got a large tumour, greater than two and a half centimetres in the angle, then you're not going to be able to preserve, preserve hearing reliably, and the translabyrinthine approach is then better again. The key to the translab approach is to have a wide transtemporal craniotomy. You've got to have wide access for big tumours to get uh, a safe and uh, good removal. And here's a couple of pictures just to show the sort of exposure we can get. With This is without any cerebellar retraction or brainstem compression uh, or, or uh, uh, releasing, we can release the CSF to uh, let uh, everything slacken off. And you can get wide exposure of the tumour early on with dural flaps retracted. And that allows debulking, early facial nerve identification, both laterally and medially, and uh, good facial nerve outcomes. For small intracanalicular tumours, it's a very nice, easy approach, and we get very, uh, very, very good exposure and tumour removal. And this is the divided vestibular cochlear nerve, and you see the, the facial nerve coming up over the uh, anterosuperior aspect. So what about hearing preservation? Well, we, the aim, of course, is to preserve useful hearing, but with total tumour removal, we don't want to be leaving tumour at the expense of trying to preserve hearing and without compromising facial nerve outcome. And I think that's a key point. Is it worthwhile? Uh, when's it possible? How's it achieved? And what are the disadvantages? Well, I'll try and quickly run through that. Clearly, hearing testing is important, and we want to look at the pure tone average as well as their speech discrimination. And we've still been using the AAO guidelines in terms of classification of hearing loss, which is, um, works quite well, but the problem is the difference between you can quickly slip from B to D uh, with, with a change in speech discrimination, and that's not entirely, uh, entirely accurate. Is it worthwhile to preserve hearing? Well, as we know from cochlear implant research, binaural hearing is certainly worthwhile, and you... It helps with sound direction detection, localization. You get improved hearing and background noise, and it avoids that head shadow effect that we get with single-sided deafness. However, if you have poor hearing in one ear with poor speech discrimination, that can actually, the unilateral distortion can impair binaural hearing. So it is a, it is a concern, and when hearing is bad with poor discrimination, there's probably no point in trying to preserve that hearing. But when one ear is worse, then you can amplify it with a hearing aid, obviously. Uh, and you've got that second ear in reserve. Um, sometimes cochlear implantation can be possible. And there is now, although I don't have experience with it, some centres are advocating you know, trans-labyrinthine removal of small tumours plus cochlear implantation, the same procedure, um, which I'm not sure may, may have a role. Um, but I have had one patient where we did a translab removal and then he was assaulted and got, lost his hearing in the other ear and so ended up uh, uh, being a cochlear implant candidate. The prognostic factors for preserving hearing are if hearing is good to start with, if the auditory brainstem response is preserved, and if the fluid signal in the labyrinth is normal, if you've got alteration in the fluid signal in the labyrinth, that's a poor prognostic sign. And of course, if the tumour is small and medial, this is small and lateral, which of course makes it difficult to access. If we go middle fossa, it's still not easy to get to the very lateral end of the canal. If we go retrosigmoid, it's still not easy to get to that lateral canal. And if the anatomy is favourable, so we would like to see a superior vestibular nerve origin, and we can perhaps predict that when the, the VEMPs uh, are present and uh, colorics are absent. Uh, so we do vestibular function testing, 
including VEMP testing. And here's an example where there's clearly a hypoactive caloric, suggesting that it is a supravestibular nerve origin, and the, brain, and the auditory brain stem response is preserved. But on the MRI scan, it does look as if the nerve is posteriorly placed rather than antero inferiorly placed, and so that might be somewhat poor prognostic uh, factor. It's hard to work past the eighth nerve to get tumour out, particularly if the facial nerve is, is posterior as well. This is not Donald Trump, but uh, rather a, uh, a lady in Melbourne having a retrosigmoid approach, and we favour a lateral position for the retrosigmoid approach, but it's the facial nerve monitoring that has dramatically altered the outcomes with, with uh, all forms of uh, acoustic neuroma and uh, any other surgery where the nerve is manipulated. For the trans lab, we, we do a supine approach with a head turn, but again fixed in the Mayfield frame, which allows us to put the Greenberg retractor on, which I find helpful. So as Jacques showed before, the, this is a retrosigmoid approach, a somewhat wider craniotomy than uh, he was demonstrating, and uh, the tumour is displayed, and then after the medial component is debulked, then a transmeatal approach is performed to the, tu the tumour within the canal. It's essential that there's meticulous preservation of vessels, and sometimes you know, the vessel can be very much in your way, but again, by resecting a bit of dura and dividing the, the subarcuate artery laterally, it can be preserved. And also, the veins need to be carefully preserved. There's the uh, uh, petrosal vein and the pontomesencephalic vein. Um, very important to preserve all the vasculature. And I like to use a, a small uh, otologic hook uh, which my neurosurgical colleague refers to as an arachnoid knife, to divide the, the arachnoid and get into the tumour plane between the normal nerve and, and the tumour. And the transmeatal approach, uh, as I said, this is a view after the internal canal has been drilled out, a laterally based dural flap, and then the dura is opened. And an instrument that I've found extremely valuable is this uh, angled dissection instrument that was originally made by Micro France, and uh, I'm not sure that it's now still available. But that allows you to reach into the lateral internal canal and uh, remove tumour. But the other key thing, and as Jacques has uh, alluded to already, this is a microscopic view of the internal canal after you think the tumour looks like it's removed. But with the endoscope, we can see that there is some tumour still laterally. And the combination of the endoscope and that uh, instrument allows you to dissect the lateral end uh, and be sure that you get a complete removal. <laughs> Using endoscope also allows you to inspect the bone that's been drilled and, be, and to see if air cells have or haven't been opened and where they have then they need to be waxed carefully to uh, prevent CSF leakage. And then that dural flap that was elevated laterally can be replaced and uh, although I'm not sure that that makes much difference to any, any CSF leak. In our series, the hearing preservation rate with retrosigmoid is not as good as middle fossa, and I don't think it's because occasionally the labyrinth might get opened. I think it's more related to the, the, the more proximal manipulation of the vas vasculature at the brainstem and in the internal canal. But the middle fossa approach Unfortunately, we don't use so often these days because all of the small tumours we tend to observe, and if they do show significant growth and come to intervention, then usually the hearing has deteriorated or they've got to the, si the si size that they're projecting into the angle. So whilst we started off doing a lot of middle fossas, it's now relatively uncommon. If we are going to do it, then uh, the Vestibular function testing to identify superior vestibular nerve is again, uh, origin is useful. And CT scan to look at the pneumatisation above the internal tri canal and the position of the arcuate eminence relative to the, the superior canal itself is very helpful in your planning. And uh, the technique that we've used is, is to use a Greenberg type retractor, which is a bit different to the original description. And uh, that I find gives very good access to the superior portion, and the, this is the meatal plane here. Um, intraoperative monitoring is, is interesting, but I'm not sure that it actually alters our outcomes, and so uh, whilst we can do near-field near uh, ABR, I, I don't know that it really makes much difference to outcome. There's the internal canal exposed, and then the, after the dura is opened, the tumour is then dissected off, 
and then we try to put a couple of stitches to approximate that dura again and then a, a fat graft to fill the, the bony defect. So what are the disadvantages of uh, hearing preservation? Well, there is potential for leaving tumour. The temporal or cerebellar retraction potentially is a problem. For the retrosigmoid, the suboccipital headache incidence is, is a, an issue. And there is the possibility of worse function of outcome. And here's just a post-operative scan some years after a retrosigmoid approach just to show two things, that the cerebellum hasn't ever fully uh, re-expanded, and you virtually never see this after a trans-labyrinthine approach. And there is a filling defect here which enhances, and indeed there's probably some residual tumour there. Interestingly, that rarely grows over time, but uh, is a concern, and hopefully is less common now that we're using the endoscope. In terms of the success of hearing preservation, when I last uh, looked at my results out of uh, 274, there were 68 middle fossas and 206 uh, retrosigmoids, but lower preservation rate with the retrosig than with the middle fossa. And I don't know to what extent that is because of the tumours being smaller uh, rather than being a different approach. So what are the disadvantages? Well, the facial function can be slightly worse, um, and that's particularly with the middle fossa where the nerve's manipulated, and for the larger retrosigmoid tumours, the translab certainly gives better, better outcomes, I would think. So is there a role for middle fossa removal for small tumours? Well, I think there is if you have a young patient who's got an enlarging tumour and deteriorating hearing, which is still worthwhile, then, then they're the ones that we should be doing middle fossas for. NF2 is certainly, in, uh, remains a very challenging problem. Um, the, we have now over 20 years experience with the brainstem implant, and whilst it, um, uh, I'm running out of time. Whilst it is interesting surgery and uh, rewarding to do, the outcomes remain limited, and it is still mainly an aid to lip rating. But for a patient who's got absolutely no hearing otherwise, they find that that still very valuable. But in my experience, they have to be well patients who are going to be want to be socially interactive to make it worthwhile. And the uh, Avastin has been now well publicised, and whilst it can result in tumour shrinkage and perhaps buy some time with patients, the problems are that it, the, uh, the cost and the need for prolonged usage and the potential problem for side effects uh, really limits, it, limits its use. And e even in Australia, we have great difficulty uh, sourcing it to use for patients. So thank you very much. I'll finish there, and uh, happy to take questions later. Thank you, Dr. I would like to welcome Dr. Suma R. from Scientific Committee of ISOCON 2016 to hand over the minutes to the chairperson. Thank you, Dr. Suma. 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 Thank you, For our next talk, the Professor Dr. Carl Bern Gutenberg, we would like to invite to the dais our chairpersons, Dr. P. G. Vishwanathan from Coimbatore and Dr. Arun Karunkar, Sai Anjali Hospital, Surat.
Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. In the next 30 minutes, I want to give you some ideas on the biomechanics of staphylococcus. This is not an overview on the different techniques and all these things, but only to give you some impressions which might be interesting from a physiological, functional point of view, and in the end to give some practical hints also for some of the techniques. Let us begin first. Otosclerosis fixes the foot plate. That means there is no sound conduction through the middle ear. But interestingly, we not only find this air bone gap with a sort of compression type, but we also have a so-called Carhartt notch. That means a cochlear difference. Why? Why is that coming? What is that coming from? Well, <clears throat> you know, when we have bone conduction, we have several parts of this bone conduction contributing to the impression of loudness in the cochlea. It comes from direct stimulation of the bone, of course. There are several compartments. Also stimulation of the air in the ear canal and of the bone here and everywhere and even from the brain inside. And in autosclerosis, as well as in all the other conductive type deafnesses, this part is not working anymore. So the compartment here, the, although it's small, but it is there, is not contributing to the sound impression of the cochlea. And this mainly depends on the natural resonance frequency of the middle ear and the ear canal that is around 2 kilohertz. And this why, as this is lessened, we have, although we have the same energy, we have less impression of sound in the cochlea due to the lack of this 2 kilohertz, round 2 kilohertz compartment. <coughs> that means on the other hand side, we should not if we do the indication for the surgery, we should not look so very much at the bone conduction around 2 kilohertz. We should not say, oh, this is not worthwhile, it is so bad, the hearing at 2 kilohertz. No, no, this is a functional effect. If we manage to have a good plasty, then we will have also a raise, a peculiar raise in the inner ear, in the conductive, in the bone hearing aid, bone hearing. Let us say just a little word on indication. The indication normally is clear for stapisplasty. Conductive hearing loss, rhinopositive, absent stapedial reflex, that it makes in more than 99% clear that this is a stapedial fixation, especially if you also use the Siegel's maneuver to see if there's a movement of the, mem of the malleus, then you can exclude the malleus fixation, and then it's nearly always stapes fixation. This is the clinical experience. But then in the last years have come up something new from the United States. There was a man, Mr. Minor, who had a very bad CT resolution, who had unfortunately not a good CT, and he had patients with some, sorry, he had patients with some difficulty of hearing and some other symptoms, and the CT, the radiologist said, oh, there is no bony coverage. And this was taken over also by other doctors, and they said, oh, if we have a superior canal sense, then we have a multitude of symptoms. And amongst one which was interesting for me, I don't deal with all the other symptoms now, with fullness of the ear and vertigo and so, only with conductive hearing loss, because then it came up that it was said, oh, if you have a defect of the bone, here, then this means that you have a conductive hearing loss, then you should not do autosclerosis surgery. And this is, to say it mildly, nonsense. First of all, here you see there is, of course, bone up there, every, and, but the resolution is so small that you cannot even see the stapes there, so the resolution shows there is, it cannot tell you anything about the bone on top. And this is one of the cases in our temporal bone lab. It has a blue line. Unfortunately, it broke before I could make a photo of it, but you see this thin bone here cannot be seen in any CT scan. Neither is it, has it been shown in this paper, which is famous because it's always referred to, but this paper also does not show a DS sense. It shows a broken bone, but it does not show a DS sense. The experiments con on this ear air conduction, which should prove that there is a significant air conduction deficit, that means not, do not stapisplasty in this case, also is not convincing because this was open to air and not to the brain and to the dura on top, all this mass. So when you look in the literature, you see there only was, they found only a little, 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 very little tiny the depression of the air conduction in the low frequencies. and. We made this experiment in the way that we also placed a dura patch on top. And here you can see this is the baseline. This is intact canal. And here with the dura patch is nearly the same, especially in the low frequencies and the high frequencies. Anyhow, there is no difference. So this means if you have a suspicion of an otosclerosis, 
We don't make a CT scan. Well, there are many countries who do CT scans, but you should not, even if the radiologist cannot show the uh, bony coverage of the superior canal, it has nothing to do with the conductive hearing loss. If there is a conductive hearing loss, it comes from the stapes, but it never comes from anything in the bony coverage. It cannot be physiologically, functionally. So now we come to the stapes. This is a view, piston replacement, a view which the normal surgeon should not see because when you see the piston like this, this means you, it's a case for a cochlear implant because there you've opened the vestibule. But for research, for examination, for measuring, this is of course the best way because here you can see the floor of the, the piston in the vestibule. Here you can see the utricle and the saccule down there and so you can measure it. So we came already on the topic, how does this work? How normally we have a concentration, a hydraulic amplification from the outer world to the inner world to the foot plate. And if we say this is hydraulic amplification, we would say, well, tympanic membrane is the same, but the foot plate is smaller now, now it's a piston. So it is more concentration. So this patient should hear even better than the normal foot plate. Is that possible? Of course, it is not possible because we do not integrate or uh, insert any additional energy. But why isn't it possible? What is the enigma behind? And that is also very simple if you, if you look at the function of the ear. The normal function is that the annular ligament is the most stable ligament in the middle ear. About 90% of all the stiffness of all the impedance of the middle ear comes from the annular ligament. This means like what you saw today, that the stapes will only move very little bit in and out. That means there is even in maximum sound transport, the amplitude of the stapes is very low. And the area is defined by the foot plate. So this is given, matching the impedance of the inner ear. So in a piston, you have suddenly no more annular ligament. So that means this piston can vibrate like this very far in and out. There is nothing that holds him. So the, the amplitude can be much larger. And the area, of course, is smaller. But the product, the volume displacement in the inner ear will remain the same. Because this, now that's physiology, this is defined by the inner ear impedance and this is not changed. So this explains why after the starting of stapes surgery, so many ideas came up. This was by stapedectomy, various uh, stapedial prosthesis already in the 60s. And, we, and our fathers, our autosurgical fathers, saw that there is a perfect restoration of hearing. Even in new, new types, different sizes, different types and so There is no, principally no difference in hearing. Why? Because the, large, the smaller the diameter, the larger will be the amplitude. Only until it goes too small, until the amplitude cannot increase, and this is around 0.3 millimeter diameter of the piston. This was shown in a brilliant uh, clinical study from Amsterdam by Rinse Tanger some time ago, who showed that down to 0.4 hearing is normal and below 0.4 hearing gets less because then amplitude cannot increase. So this is why we use, like Ugo Fisch and others also, the 0.4 piston because it has never been proven scientifically that the larger piston gives a better result. Why not? Because it is always the same, the amplitude will increase. So, and the second point is, it is not the question of the diameter of the piston. Here, they have different types of pistons, but it is always a question of the diameter of the perforation, because it's not only the piston that vibrates, but also the ligament, also the connective tissue around the piston that contributes to the vibrational energy into the inner ear. But what you learned is we must not impede or decrease the possibility of vibration amplitude by nothing because this will affect it ex uh, intensively the, the product of hearing. So if you have an obliterative otosclerosis, please make a, not only a small hole, but drill away, and this has been also shown by our ancestors already, but this is why you should drill away all the bone here to have a good space here so that there is no bony contact, because bony contact of the piston to the bone, to the obliteration, will decrease the amplitude, and like you saw at the beginning, the, the, the area will remain the same, so if the amplitude is reduced, will you reduce the, uh, the displacement of fluid in the inner ear? So this is clear. Have a free vibrating here in the vestibule. But what is here? So this is the crucial point, the other place where we can act as autosurgeons. Here, if we place a prosthesis, 
This is the crimping around the long incus process. So what did we do until now, or what is the regular way? Like we learned from McGee forceps, we place the forceps around and we crimp the uh, piston, the, the, the wire loop around. But this is not crimping in a correct way. You see, this is a McGee piston uh, forceps, and it crimps only on two sides. There's a wire, is an open wire loop. So this is not what you would expect for, on a mechanical basis, to have a really solid contact. It was always said if you crimp too strong, too, if there's too much contact, then there will be an erosion. But if you look really to the erosion, you see it is no, never only on two places, on two parts where the crimper had crimped. Additionally, at the moment when the pressure, when the, there should be a little bit erosion, then the pressure is real, zero, that there could be no more erosion. But you always see it's a circular erosion like here. It is more a foreign body reaction. And it has nothing to do with the, with the blood supply circulation on the outer side in the mucosa that is comprised, because we know that the incus has its blood supply from the inner side. There's a bone marrow inside, and this gives a lot of blood supply inside. And interestingly, again, when you have these ears with the failure there, mostly it is metal, it was the steel wire, old Shugnate steel wire prosthesis. You see, it is erosion, there is no pressure. There is no blood supply, but it's a circular erosion. So I tried once to increase the, pre the, the, the contact here with a little uh, piece of bone there. Uh, unfortunately, it gave the same results like before, because if it is steady and if there is no erosion, if it is a steady state, then you have good hearing in all cases, because the sound transmission is directly going in and out. But what we designed to improve a little bit the possibility to crimp the uh, prosthesis around the wire loop is uh, crimper here. Another design of the crimper that means he pulls, he wraps, he wraps the wire loop around the incus. He does not press on it, but loops around. And this is how it looks like. You see, it is as a bit like this, and it goes down and it wraps around so that there is no direct contact to the bone. What, is, what does it mean? You should, if you look into the ear after having crimped, you should be sure that there is really 100% mechanical stability. That means in and out, like this, should really be followed by an in and out movement of the incus, of this prosthesis, and not by anything else here. So how can you test this? Well, it's very simple. You must remember we have a rotation axis here. That means if we press down the incus, then due to the retraction, due to the, to the rotation axis here, the incus will go a little bit like this. And this means the foot of the piston should go a little bit also up and down, up and down. And you will see this when I make this little video, this little uh, slide rotating, rotates around the axis and you see what it looks like here. It goes up and down. And, oh sorry. And this means you really have 100% st stable and no loose contact here at the incus. You can see this also in a short video. This is a crimper, crimping it strongly. This was the crimper, and here's the other. And now you see how where it moves. When I press down with the needle, this goes up and down. Can you see that? Was it visible? Again, pressing it down, up and down. And this is some connective tissue down there. So this is the design of this crimper, and it has another advantage. We made a lot of experiments about tremor in autosurgery. What is the danger? This is called this crimping is the most difficult movement in middle ear surgery because of the long lever arm. There is always a little tremor there, and to to decrease this tremor, to make it easier, from change from crimping to loosening the crimper. We may integrate a little spring there. That means you don't have to, to change, to, to, to switch between flexor muscles and extensor muscles, but you just change a little bit the, the flexor uh, extension, flexor stability due to the spring, and that makes it easy to have less tremor there. So this was a little idea on how to improve mechanics of stapesplasty. If you don't want to crimp there, of course, in the last years has become a lot of new ideas on it. For example, one very simple thing, very easy thing as uh, the soft clip. That means you just put it on and you don't have to crimp it because there's a spring mechanism. You just press it on and then it's stable. The advantage is it's much easier. You don't need this crimping. The other thing is that it is very stable and <clears throat> sometimes it tilts a little bit and contacts the, the rim of the perforation. And then again, you have a could have a decrease of the vibration amplitude. But this is a much easier way to, to bring it on top of, onto the incus long process. 
There is another, there is this soft clip, this, this heat me heating mechanism, 19 nor, and also by Kurtz, and this advantage here is that it has no direct contact of the laser heating to the very se sensitive mucosa of the long incus process to prevent any risk of <clears throat> of uh, erosion at the point where the, uh, the alloy, where the metal contacts the bone. So this can also be by just by heating here the upper part far away from the bone, uh, then it comes together. Where is it even more important to, co to guarantee a very stable contact? That is, if you have no incus anymore, if you need a malleus vestibulo pexi, then here at the malleus you have this movement, it's much larger of course, and there you must pay attention that it does not go in and out too deeply. And here you have this rotation around, so you should be aware that this is a very stable contact. And this is the advantage of the, of the band, of the titanium band of the modern prosthesis. If you have a wire, it was nearly impossible to really have a stable fixation. It was always a little loose contact movement around. With a band here, if you crimp it or if you pull it around, then you have a really good contact. And at, then at the first time, I had results nearly as good as the normal, normal stapidectomy, stapisplasty with a the piston there. And the, the new, but I've not done it yet, but uh, this is also a possibility with a clip mechanism in a, a prosthesis ready for inserting uh, this malleus vestibulum clip prosthesis there. The question now, when we have done the surgery and the patient has a good hearing, then he comes to us and says, oh, I want to fly. I'm a flyer, a pilot. Or <clears throat> I want to dive, go underwater. Can I do that, doctor? Can I do this with a piston, with a prosthesis, tapis prosthesis? You told me the piston will move without any restraint in and out. Is this dangerous? And there are many countries in the world where it is, for example, forbidden for patients who had stapisplasty to fly or to dive, to go diving. Or flying, even private pilots are not allowed with a stapisplasty, after, after stapisplasty. But we know on the other hand side that it worked, that this danger of contacting the saculus or the inner ear compartments with a piston cannot be so very large because there are reports from America, from jet pilots, and also in, in Israel, when they had the war against the Arabs, they could not, they had several pilots, jet pilots, who had had stapisplasty, and they could not, uh, they had to rely on every pilot they had. They were, had very many, very few pilots, and so they let them fly, and it worked. Even the jet pilots diving and have this huge pressure difference, it worked. So the question is, what is behind? Is it just a belief? Is it just that we say, oh, after stop as plastic, you should not fly? Why? Hmm, I don't know, but it is unsafe. No, we must stay, try to find a scientific way to, to analyze this. What happens here? And again, we come back to the function of the ear. We know hearing, we have very, very small vibration amplitudes, molecular size, forget it for any danger. But here in the tympanometry, that means in the atmospheric pressures, flying, diving, blowing the nose, everything, there can occur movements of up till one millimeter. And what happens if these movements, if this pressure rises and these movements of one millimeter go through the ossicular chain and impale the piston, for example, into the inner ear. So we know, again, you saw this already, we have this movement of the malleus of up till one millimeter and the normus tapis, which again is hold in his annular ligament. This is why nature had designed the annular ligament so stable. By the way, it is, still, it is still incredible what this annular ligament does. On the one hand side, it can transmit the sensitivity, the vibrations of submolecular dimensions. On the other hand side, it's so stable to hold the tapis very strongly, around 35 grams. You will hear in my next lecture on ossicular uh, prosthesis, we made some measurements on the stability of the annular ligament. So it's incredible what this does. So normal ear, normal tapis does not move up to one, two, two or three erythrocytes diameter. That's nothing. So no danger for the inner ear. The big advantage for the otosclerosis patient is that he has a good tympanic membrane. That means here it is stops. Above 400, it does not move anymore. You remember the side about the collagen fibers? This holds, this, this, this is the design why the tympanic membrane behaves like a solid wall above 300, 400 millimeter water column. There is no more movement. There is only movement until 300, 400 millimeter. No more. But until then, we have a lot of movement of the ambo. We have nearly no movement of the stapes in and out, decapascal, millimeter water column. This is the movement. Nearly no stapes, but 
if we replace the stapes by a piston, which is no longer held by annular ligament, then suddenly this piston will move, will move quite a lot, because there's no, nothing that holds him. And in worst case, this, is, this had been a temporal bone that moved only 200 to 300, that's only 500 micrometers. We had temporal bones that moved up to one millimeter. So what will happen? And now again, you cannot see from the outside. During surgery, you cannot see. But what will happen? This is again a view into the vestibule from outside. Here's the piston. And here you see the foot of the piston. This is at minus 400 millimeter water column in the outer world, in the outer ear canal. That means like Valsalva, blowing the nose. In the middle ear, you have an overpressure, 400 millimeter water column. The piston has gone out. And afterwards, the, pa the patient swallows or sniffs, makes an underpressure. What do you think what will happen? This is the position of the piston. And this is 0.5 millimeters. Now you must remember that the uterculus and the saccular, they are here, the, the, uh, the real membrane contacts here. So this explains why in some patients sometimes there could be vertigo after the surgery. Fortunately for us, nature had designed the inner ear components in a way that they are in some places, especially in the posterior part, far enough away from the footplate. The undersurface of the footplate. Here is the undersurface of the footplate. You see 1.5, 1.0. So if you imagine that the maximum movement which we measured in our temporal bones was 0.5 millimeter, you are still far enough away. If by chance nature had designed this, this, the vestibulum this way, that there is the footplate, and the vestibule and the, the sacrosur is directly underneath the footplate, we would never be able to establish plastic because the patient, even if you place the, the the, the, the piston in there, even after his walking up here the stairs and so, he would already become vertigous because the piston will go inside, contact the reticle and he will have vertigo. And all the ear surgeons who had done stapesplasty, they know what happens, local anesthesia, if you go a little bit too deep or especially here in the upper part where the distance is only 0 0.7, 0 0.5 here. And if a piston, if you made, this was in former time, when we did stapedectomy, we took out the complete foot plate, and the piston was touching here up the urticle, 0 0.5 only, then the patient said, oh, a vertigo. And what was the mistake which we did at that time? We said, oh, the piston is too long, we cut the piston. That was wrong, because what happened afterwards? We put in the sort of piston, no vertigo anymore, but after surgery, the patient blew his nose, the piston went out and stood aside. The majority of the revision cases which I had to do was always piston too short because it cut. But the simple idea is just replace the piston, no, place the piston here in the posterior part, here, where it's deeper, where, like in a ship, when you have a ship, you must go into deep waters. Put the ship onto deep waters here and put connective tissue here so that that does not dislodge, and then it stays here, and this is why we can work with nearly always the 4.5 piston. We never needed a shorter one. And short is, is difficult or it's not dangerous. It's not dangerous in this way that there will be vertigo, but dangerous that in the way that it can come out and there's bad hearing afterwards or could massive conductive hearing loss. And here you see also again in the Schuknecht vertical section here, you see the footplate, how near it is the uticle here. This is the footplate. So you should put it where? Deep water, here. There it is. Here you make the perforation. This was already written by our ancestors. When I did my first step is plastic, I read by plaster and so make the perforation the posterior part. Take out the posterior half of the foot plate. This was well known. But if you look sometimes in the new modern textbooks or also in, in some explanations, they make the perforation in the center of the foot plate. And the center of the foot plate comes nearer to the utricle. So we always try to be out at the posterior part, take out the posterior part, and if, some, if by malchance the posterior pole of the foot plate comes out, it doesn't matter, then I'm sure this patient will not have vertigo. This is a very safe thing. What we do additionally to decrease these amplitudes, these movements in air, atmospheric pressure variations, is to cover, to, to surround it, to wrap it into connective tissue here, and with the scarring of this tissue, the dis this displacement of the piston will be decreased. This has nothing to do with hearing. The vibrations, this is unimpeded because we talked about molecular size vibrations. It's like the, uh, like the, <coughs> like the, 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 the collagen fibers in the tympanic membrane. For these vibrations, this is soft, this is not important. Only if it moves more and more and more. Then it is hold here, strangled in the scar tissue, and so it cannot move very much in and out. 
So this is the idea how to do it in surgery. So again, after surgery, the patient comes and says, well, you have explained to me a lot, but now again, am I allowed to fly or not? My doctor is the, as the medical brevet. He says, no, you're not allowed to fly or to dive. What do you do? It's very simple. Can you test it? Can you test if this patient will be a day in, on risk in diving and flying that he can suffer any vestibular irritation? Yes, you can test it, very simply. Either by doing here this, uh, these glasses, or which is of course better because you have something for the records, you make electronostagmography to record the eye movement, that means the vestibular reaction, and you make tympanometry at the same time. And if you do this at the same time, this is unfortunately in German, but this is with closed eyes, this is normal, and this is with pressure. And you increase the pressure plus minus, plus minus 400. And if, like in this case, you have the nystagmus, then, and additionally, if the patient says, oh yeah, I have vertigo, then you know something's wrong. But this can be always done, and normal, in the normal case, when at the end of the surgery, you test the patient and there is no vertigo, then normally there shouldn't be any problem. This is, by the way, why we do local anesthesia in stapesplasty. It's not for hearing. There we crimp it and then we are sure if it is not fitting, then there must be something else. We cannot, uh, we cannot uh, therapy. But we want to test if there is vertigo, if the piston is in the right position and if it does not touch the, any inner ear compartments. And this is why we all we press down and we feel with the finger, with the pressing down, how far the ligaments of the middle ear Malleus and Incus allow to go inside because this is a, a predictor for the, for the post-operative displacement in atmospheric pressures. This is like you can do test with your needle, as like with your knee or with your elbow, you can only go until here, the rest is held by the ligaments, not more. And this is with a needle touching going down and of course gentle touching because you should not luxate the Incus and Sabis, but there you can see how deep it goes. And if the piston is at the posterior part, then, and the patient says, no vertigo, then you can be sure he can fly and dive, and you can, again, document it by this test, and you will have a, we call it pressure vestibular ENG, pressure ENG, and then you can let him fly after surgery. There is no danger. So this is important, and then you can send him with this to this doctor, and what I heard in France, I'm talking since 10 years in France, and now finally they've changed it. They all, in France it was forbidden, and now it is individual uh, testing, and then it is allowed in France to go diving and flying again. The last question, time is running short, and the last question is, now this is also for indication again, what do you do when, when you have the only hearing ear? This is a deaf ear, and this is a patient who has really a bad, this is Carhartt again, but again, this is 40, 50 decibel hearing loss in the cochlea, and here this is nearly deaf, this is practically deaf. Any hearing aid is not working here. And if you could close this airborne gap and give him a hearing aid here, that would be fine. And the patient comes and says, could you do something for me? Well, in former times, and this is what we heard, and there are still litigation courses in Germany running, on this case, <clears throat> in former times, it was forbidden to do otosclerosis in the last and only hearing ear, because we know nobody is, per nobody, is, is, uh, nobody can tell, guarantee that he will have no hearing deficit. There is always around up till 1% in otosclerosis surgery where you cannot predict that the inner ear will remain stable, especially in a case where here there's also quite some inner ear problems already. And this happened. And uh, so it was forbidden in former times. But nowadays, due to the invention of the cochlear implant, which can be used either here, in this deaf ear, this would of course be the first thing, or if it is deaf too long, then perhaps viewing, if we have a deaf ear, you can use here, and the patient with a cochlear implant hears better than this, but it can at least be a try to have with a simple surgery, with otosclerosis surgery, half an hour, local anesthesia, then give him a good fitting hearing aid, he's better off than with a cochlear implant. But cochlear implant is in reserve, and this is the big change from former times where it was absolutely forbidden, and nowadays I think this change, cochlear implant, also changed the habit, the indications for otosclerosis, far advanced otosclerosis surgery. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Doctor. I request Dr. Narayan, Senior EAT Surgeon and former GMO Malapuram, to hand over the minute to the chairperson.
Can start. Thank you, dear chairman. Uh, I would like to present you uh, a work on MRI in Bell's paralysis. His work I did uh, 10 years ago at least. And uh, I believe this problem was solved. The value of MRI in Bell's paralysis or in zoster paralysis, in acute facial paralysis. And in fact, in different roundtables, where I was invited, I realized that very few people take care of MRI. And for me, MRI is essential. And it solves the problem to surgical decompression. You know, it's not now very fashion to perform surgical decompression in acute facial paralysis. There are very few cases, but there are some cases. In these cases, MRI is very important in the decision making. So, what are the questions? Are the inflammatory events evident on MRI? Is there any specific lesion like enhancement of the facial nerve? The answer is definitively yes. The second question, the most important for us as a surgeon and a medical doctor, is there any relation between the inflammatory lesion on the MRI, that means the enhancement on the MRI, and what we find during surgery? The answer is again, yes, there is a perfect relation. And so for me, this is a conclusion already. My talk is quite finished. MRI is very important for the decision making to decide facial decompression when there is no recovery, no recovery with the medical treatment after facial paralysis, of course, is not to do. First, the inflammatory lesion, of course, is not so obvious, but we have to take care with MRI T1 after Bell's paralysis or after Zoster syndrome, you see, is mainly at the levels of the geniculate ganglion. This is at the level of the second portion, and you have enhancement, typical enhancement, and you see there is nothing on the opposite side. And the enhancement is always on the side of the facial paralysis. There is also another symptom, more difficult to see, is a hypersignal in T2. But notice only this point, we have enhancement in T1 gadolinium. It can come, you see, again, this is at the end of the internal auditory canal, first portion, this is at the beginning of the second portion, you have the same image here with I. So gadolinium enhancement occurs mainly as a distal part of the internal auditory canal and at the level of the geniculate ganglion. It was already mentioned by Hugo Fisch, but now we have an objective test. This is obvious for us. But we can have also an enhancement. This is a geniculate, geniculate again. We have a second portion, you see, is not so obvious. And you have also the third portion, but it's less common. So we have to study all the course of the facial layer when you have facial paralysis, acute facial paralysis. And sometimes, it looks like a small tumor at the bottom of the internal auditory canal. And it was a young lady with facial paralysis, and they come for tumoral process. But if you look on the T2, you see this is the same patient, there is nothing. This is only inflammatory process, this is not a tumoral process. So, what is the distribution of the enhancement? Again, I emphasize this point, geniculate ganglion for best paralysis, of Ramsey syndrome, then the first portion, then the second, and last is the third portion of internal auditory canal. So, geniculate ganglion in the main part of the inflammatory process. 
So we can see, this is was a study, 186 cases and 83% of cases we have enhancement. Not in all, but in 83. And after several months, you see three months, we have studied six cases. We have still enhancement, but you see there is no relationship between enhancement and the severity of the facial paralysis. So you can have enhancement with a facial weakness of a typical facial paralysis. And you see, in, out of six cases, we have grade two, three, five, and six. So this is a conclusion, the first conclusion. Gadolinium enhancement of facial nerve, there is no correlation of the severity. There is no pronostic value, but this is a sign there is an inflammatory process at the level of the facial nerve. This is a study between the case without enhancement of the MRI. The patient was suffering of facial paralysis, Bell's paralysis, 14 cases, but no enhancement at the MRI. And this is another theory, 76 patients with Bell's paralysis. We did MRI and we have enhancement. In the long-term follow-up with medical treatment, I don't talk about surgery, it's the natural outcome of the facial uh, paralysis and the recovery. You see, after six months, all cases except one, there is a complete recovery. And when there is MRI, you see, after six months, we have about 15%. They are not a good recovery. The patient is not satisfied. The surgeon is always satisfied. The neurologist is always satisfied, but not always the patient. You have to ask the patient. So this is another consequence. There is no pronostic value, but if you perform uh, MRI and you have enhance no enhancement, with the facial paralysis, you know that the pronostic is excellent and there is always a recovery. Another question is to say, oh, is it specific? Because on the opposite side, we have sometimes some hyper signal, some enhancement. You see this case. You are here, this is a facial paralysis at the level of the geniculate ganglion. And ici, here, you don't see very well, but on the MRI, there is some um, light, you see? But you see the difference of intensity? So again, there is no normal enhancement of the facial layer on MRI in T1 gadolinium. When there is enhancement, there is always an inflammatory process. So this is what I say. When you have uh, an ans uh, enhancement of the facial layer, on the opposite side of a normal MRI, the intensity is very low. When there is facial paralysis, there is always a very typical intensity. This is the most important for us now. Are there any correlation between what we find during surgery and during what is the result of the image? We operate, I will tell you why, several patients, about 20, 24 patients with facial paralysis, after facial paralysis, before with medical treatment, steroid and acyclovir, there is no recovery after several, several weeks. We did MRI, we have enhancement, and we would like to know what is the lesion, surgical lesion, and we perform complete decompression for the third portion to the first portion. It was a study on 20. So, for the geniculate ganglion, you see enhancement here, and what we find, there is only one case, there is no correlation out of 24. Excellent correlation. Second segment, again, excellent correlation. Third segment, very few cases, but we have some cases. Again, excellent correlation between what we find on the MRI and what you find. What we can say, when there is inflammatory process, the facial layer is red, swallowing. When it is normal, it's only white, course of the neural structure. Ah, it changed a little bit for the first portion. You see, for the first portion, this is a facial entrapment. It's only few cases, and the image is more important. 
And completely different is at the level of the internal auditory canal. We have image. In many cases, we did decompression in uh, eight, uh, 18 per 80 cases. That means we open the internal auditory, auditory canal for nothing, only because there is image, and we have no entrapment. Why? It's very surprised on this point. The enhancement at the level of the internal auditory canal is not due to the inflammatory process on the nerve, it's due to the inflammatory process on the dura mater, on the arachnoid wrapping. This is the reason there is no correlation. But for the first, second, geniculate ganglion second and third portion, there is a perfect correlation between the inflammatory process of the fascial nerve, that means the swelling of the fascial nerve, and the nerve. So, what is the conclusion? When you have to do some surgical decompression, you have to follow exactly the indication of the MRI. If you are pleased to decompress all the fascial nerve if you want, but only the part, the location from the MRI enhancement is enough. You see what I mean? You see? This is inflammatory process of the genicular ganglion. This is the petrous nerve. This is the first portion. This is internal auditory canal. And this is the second portion. You see, this is a normal second portion. And we see the inflammatory process is red and swelling. Fascial. This is a patient. This is a, a closer view. We have inflammatory process of the layer. First portion, but nothing inside the internal auditory canal. Another case, again, inflammatory process of geniculate ganglion. You see the difference? This is a, the first portion is inflammatory, red, and immediately there is a difference at the level of the internal auditory canal. The fascial nerve become normal. And this was exactly what it was uh, at the level of the MRI, except at the level of the internal auditory canal. So we can follow the MRI. This is another patient. One month, you see the patient, it was, it was a, a neuroma. In fact, it's not neuroma. This was a patient with a swelling of the geniculate ganglion. And you see the first portion here. This image, there is a second portion, first portion. There is nothing in the internal auditory canal. So the swelling is only at the level of geniculate ganglion. Look. People say the swallowing and the swelling of the, uh, the, not the swallowing, sorry, the swelling of the genical ganglion is invention of the surgeon. No, it's not invention, it exists. It's true. You see, even the petrous nerve is inflammatory. This is the first portion, this is the second portion. So we are doing some real decompression of the patient. At the opposite, and this is very important because at the beginning you don't know, we did on delay fascial paralysis, that we see the patient after one, three, four months, there is still fascial paralysis, but no enhancement of the fascial layer. So it was later, you see, five months after, no gadolinium enhancement of the fascial layer, and there is nothing to do. It's atrophic nerve. So the consequence and the conclusion, we have several cases like that, but now we, for, we stop. When on delay fascial paralysis after two or three months, if you perform MRI and there is no enhancement of the fascial layer, there is no place for the surgery at all. It's finished. It's too late. Next, what is the interest to perform early decompression, light decompression? What means early decompression for us? Of course, all the patients with fascial paralysis, total fascial paralysis. I don't talk about par, uh, partial fascial paralysis. There is always a complete recovery. I am talking about total fascial paralysis. The patients, they have two weeks steroid and aciglovir. And it's very rare, but it exists, that after two weeks, there is no any symptom of recovery. Oh, my God. There is no symptom of recovery. And the patient is really afraid of that. There are very few. And, but we don't see the patient early. 
Sometimes we see the patient mainly after one month, after two months, he comes from neurologic. We have the chance to follow 15 cases of Ramsey syndrome. Patient was grade five, six, after two weeks to six weeks. And this is a surgery. These three patients we operate less than one month, all complete recovery. After five weeks, you see, one complete recovery, but one maintain grade four. And over six weeks, that means over one month, the same, we have no perfect recovery. This was mentioned in the literature, but we can prove that early decompression, of course, is not to say I decompress all the patient. This is another study, because we don't see the patient immediately. He was a patient, we see the patient with facial paralysis after one month to four months. All we did MRI and all have enhancement on the MRI. So it was a failure of the medical treatment and you see the patient, 12 have uh, Ausbragman 4, 11 Ausbragman 5, and 4 Ausbragman 6. When you are during one month, a total facial paralysis, even grade 4, you are very anxious about that. And we decide the surgery following the location of the MRI, that means mainly middle fossa approach for geniculate ganglion. After three months, you see change. We have eight patients grade two, three, uh, 13 patients. Grade three is complicated to say grade three because grade three normally is facial spasm, post paralytic hemifacial spasm, you know, but so his improvement, and you see no anymore grade five or six. We follow the patient six months later. You see again, we have improvement. We have no anymore five, six. We have only grade four, only three patients out of 24. So that means even delay, decompression. If you have positive MRI, you can improve the facial weakness at least two grades. And you see, if you have, a, even for yourself, of your young lady, to move from grade four to grade two is something very important. So we have the place, and you see, we did this, it was 27 cases from 91 to 2005. That means over 15 years. That means we are operate one to two cases per year. But this patient must be operated. We have not to ignore this patient. So this is my conclusion. Much more than uh, the monitoring of the fascial nerve. I am very sorry to say that. But the monitoring of the fascial nerve is not useful at all. You have to see the patient. What we need something. We see if there is a total fascial paralysis. We, is only. If there is no recovery, at all after a good medical treatment, that means steroid, high dose, at least two weeks, we have, and it is emergency, to ask MRI. And I know it's sometimes very difficult to have MRI the same week, not to have MRI in one month, one month and a half, immediately. And if you have positive MRI, you have to perform surgery immediately. And this is not so easy to decide to perform, to add in the surgical operating program middle fossa approach, because it's mainly middle fossa. But this is a rule if you would like to have a complete recovery of all patients with facial paralysis or all patients with Ramsen syndrome. You know that Ramsen syndrome, 20% of the patients, they have no recovery, 20. And for Bell's paralysis, it's between five to 15. It was the last study it was done in Brazil, Brazilian Resula, uh, journal. It was a meta-analysis over 1,000 cases. So this must be done within the month. And this is the most difficult to see the patient early, to perform MRI early, and to perform surgery early. But if you perform surgery, you have to follow exactly the location of the inflammation, prove by the MRI. Thank you very much.
So let's see of the MRI. Yes. Tesla. Can you say about that? Uh, facility of MRI? I, I don't understand. So what is? Sorry, I don't follow you. The MRI, the machine is rated according by the Tesla capacity. And uh, we need uh, one Tesla for this study. We have only one point. Okay, okay, sorry, I understand. I am very sorry, but I am a surgeon. I don't understand anything regarding MRI. The MRI was my colleague Nadine Girard. And we did this study, and there is a hospice, and we uh, perform MRI systematically for Bell's paralysis. I fully agree, we don't need systematic MRI for Bell's paralysis. And it was the reason I emphasized the point, if you have Bell's paralysis without medical recovery, is the time to perform MRI. Which kind of MRI, which machine, I don't know. I am very sorry, I can answer. Thank you, Doctor. I request Dr. Sunil Kumar Kedi, Professor, Department of ENG, Calvin Valley College, and former President of EOR Malabar Chapter. Thank you very much for this very nice uh, introduction. Uh, pleasure to see you again. It's always very nice. And uh, so I'm going to talk about revision, AP surgery. I think tomorrow we have, uh, we are supposed to have a, a live session on revision. I, I, I should have a patient with an indication of surgery for revision, a fate, uh, three failures, I think. So th the aim of my presentation today is to give you the tips I'm using uh, according to the surgical presentation, again, just like I talked this morning with the congenital malformation, I want to show you the techniques I'm using uh, according to the cause of failure. Because, by the way, this is the problem. We know also that uh, either uh, the surgical technique itself and the cause of failure influencing the results, of course. So we can find different types of cause of failure. And again, even if you ask a preoperative CT scan, uh, I don't... Uh, take too much attention to the CT scan. I do it, of course, but I mean it's during the operation itself that you can clearly identify the real cause of failure. And the first one is quite an easy one, of course, if you have just a short prosthesis, it's just removing the prosthesis and, and finalize the technique itself. But here, just before showing the technique, it's interesting to discuss about the preventive points uh, for this type of cause of failure. If you see this one, I was performing uh, the revision and after elevating the flap, you can see that the first point is that you cannot see anything into the other window, which means that the previous surgeon didn't do a clear exposure of the other window with the two landmarks that I like to see, the fascia nerve, which should be seen here, and the pyramidal process 
of the stapes tendon. So it was not clear, and it's clear that if you try to put a prosthesis in this situation, you hide most of the, of most of the gap, and then you cannot do anything clearly. So the first point for me is to enlarge the bony rim resection. So of course, just like for primary, I will use the curette here to remove the bone from here and in order to be able to uh, uh, clearly identify the fascia nerve here. So now we can see and we can work properly. And you see that here, immediately you can identify the fact that the prosthesis shaft is dislocated posteriorly. I was also checking malus incus mobility and the, 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 the piston itself. And you look for the round window, of course. Uh, and then to remove this type of Teflon prosthesis is quite easy uh, because you can just uh, open up the, the loop of the piston itself. And then after measuring the distance from the incus to the stapes, I will perform a 0.8 millimeter diameter stapedotomy followed by vein graft deposition. It's the cost technique, of course, so I'm, I'm using the cost technique all the time. And all the surgeries, as you know, I'm performing them uh, using transcanal approach. So I'm placing the vein here. We'll talk in more detail this technique tomorrow morning. Uh, so I'm using another uh, piston because the incus in this case is intact, so it's clear that I will uh, use the, the incus, I will introduce the shaft within the stapedotomy and then the loop will be crimped with two uh, um, hooks like this or curved forceps anyway, and then I will look for the bending side. And you see the beginning, uh, at the beginning it's flexible, where at the beginning it was resistant. So that is, uh, I would say, a basic cause of failure. To prevent this problem, you need to uh, clearly measure. That's the point. Many surgeons I know do not measure uh, perioperatively, and they use an average 4.5 millimeter prosthesis length, which I really believe is, is a mistake, because in my series of now more than 6,000 cases, uh, the average length is true. It's 4.5 for 75% of the cases. There are still 25% which are less or more, which means that if you put always a 4.5, you increase uh, the risk of failure. So I'm using this stapes measuring rod with three hooks. The lower one is, is 3.5, the mid one is 4, and the superior one is 4.5. I usually try to measure from the mid surface of the incus. Now, the Preparing, uh, and then I will cut the prosthesis at the right length, and I'm using the uh, piston like this in, in, a, cup, in a, um, a cutting block, and I will cut the prosthesis according to the measure, uh, exactly at the measure. So you see there are different uh, holes, so I cut it at 4.5. It means that I measured 4.5. And then we need to uh, open the loop of the piston to break the memory, and again, tomorrow morning in the instruction course, I will go back into more details with this technique. And then we need to crimp it again. So these are the two points to be sure that you try to decrease uh, the risk of um, a short prosthesis. Uh, now the, the other thing is the dislocation of the prosthesis. And again, the success rate and the technique itself will depend on the status of the, of the rest of the ossicular chain and specifically of the incus. Because if the incus is intact, again, would be more easy. And again, you see the same mistake was made by the previous surgeon. The uh, bony rim was not large enough. So I'm removing and enlarging also the, the bony rim resection using the curette again and checking malus incus mobility here. Again, you need to do that all the time. It's, it needs to be a step-by-step -step technique again to check every detail. And I'm using a handheld a probe. Uh, this is a CO2 laser with a handheld probe and I'm progressively vaporizing the previous uh, tissue, which was interposed by the previous surgeon, and I'm trying to enlarge progressively the approach to the stapes foot plate. You can see that it's pretty narrow here, so you have to do it progressively until you reach the blue line, and then open up the blue line, uh, finalizing the stapedotomy. And of course, in this case, the type of reconstruction would be the same with, uh, and now we measure again, and you see the three, hook, the three hooks that I was talking about. And then the same thing will be made with the uh, uh, same type of prosthesis. In this case, that would be a cost piston, I guess, because this is, the incus is perfectly intact. So it's the same point then. Um, so to prevent this prosthesis dislocation, if you use this type of prosthesis itself, you need to crimp. 
the loop of a piston. You know that this Teflon material has a memory, but I would tell you not to believe too much into the memory. You need to help the crimp, the memory I would say, by crimping the, uh, the loop, uh, which can be done by a curve forceps or uh, two hooks like I'm doing this, and tomorrow again we'll talk about that more, more, more in, in, into more, in more details. Um, now, the bending side, the piston should bend but not move. It means that in that case, the distal tip is clearly located inside the stapedolomy, and then I will check the malus incus mobility. So you see the bending sign. If it's too short and you do that, you can see the shaft going away from the other window clearly. It's a very simple sign, but if you apply that at the end of the surgery, you will be sure that the prosthesis is too short or at the right length. For example, here on the left, that is a personal failure. You, need, you know, of course, that the French never make mistake, but sometimes we have some. And so in that case, I was placing the piston inside the stapedolomy and looking for the bending side. So I'm creeping, everything seems fine, I'm happy because I'm going to have my glass of wine just right after that. But I need to wait a little bit because I'm going to check the bending side and you will see that the piston will slip away and not bending. This is a difference. And if you see on the right, I'm changing with a longer prosthesis and you will see the difference with the new bending sign which will be uh, clear. You will see that, that this, the piston will bend. So it was something like 0.5 millimeter or more. So you see the bending now in a second. Now, here is the bending sign. So you can clearly see the difference. The, the other uh, problem which is becoming more complicated to treat is the over window reobliteration. Just like a primary surgery, this happens. And this is much more difficult in terms of technique. So the technique is the same for me, but the, the way of drilling out uh, the foot plate is different. I, as you will see, I'm not performing a straightforward stapedolomy, but I'm enlarging progressively the approach to the foot plate by progressively with a small circling using uh, some movement uh, of the burr, enlarging this area. But first, we need here to remove the prosthesis and then identify and check uh, the foot plate area, which again, it's a, a quite a narrow of a window. So I'm going to start by drilling out the foot plate here, and you see it's clearly a reobliteration. There was no connection with the labyrinth in this case, and you see this is what I'm saying. I, I'm not performing a straight stapedolomy because it's, it could be dangerous, it's not perfectly fixed sometimes, so you need to re remember that this biscuit foot plate can dislocate as a whole, so you need to take your time and just leave the diamond dust doing the job by itself, without any pressure. And then I measure at the end of the procedure, because sometimes you, measure, you, 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 you can uh, drilling more than 0 0.5, 0 0.75, even one millimeter more. So it makes uh, a, a problem if you measure only before. And I'm going to cut the prosthesis. In this case, this is a different prosthesis. It's a different prosthesis, but I'm using a bucket prosthesis. I was showing that this morning again. The distal tip is introduced within the stapedolomy, and then the lenticular process will be introduced within the uh, hollow head. This is different, and I was using this one rather than the piston because there was a partially very small erosion of the incus, and I didn't want to place another loop here. So you have to choose your prosthesis according to the type of the aspect of the ossicular chain. The other problem would be, of course, the incus erosion, which is a very classical cause of failure, which is very, it's a very interesting technique, and this will lead for me to always a malus to stapedolomy procedure. I know that many surgeons now move to the use of a cement, if it's possible, when, when you have uh, uh, some residual incus. But I prefer, in all cases, using uh, malus to stapedolomy procedure with the uh, malice relocation technique. So this is a left ear. You see, now I'm going to check everything. And again, uh, you see that uh, the loop is here. And I'm sure that many surgeons would use a cement here. But we need to remove this prosthesis because I'm going to do a malice stapedolomy. So I prefer using that. But this is a personal choice. I'm not saying this is the best technique. I'm just saying what I'm doing. So malice relocation starts by separating entirely the malice from the tympanic membrane. We will talk about that later today on ossicular reconstruction. The malleus should be entirely separated from the malleus, and then you can remove the incus, because the, the incus helps if you keep it first. And you see there is a gap here. So I want to reduce the gap. This is the aim of the malleus relocation technique. So I will overstretch, after having cut the tense tamponi tendon, I will overstretch the anterior tamponomalia ligament. And this, in this case, of course, you can place more easily the malleus where, when, wherever you want, 
Of course, you need to stick back the malleus to the tympanic membrane to be sure that you will measure from the right position of the malleus. Otherwise, there is a tendency to see the malleus medialized, and then you can uh, cut the prosthesis too shortly. Again, we need to perform the stapedotomy. So I always recreate a fenestration in all cases uh, by using a laser or the drill. And then I measure from the malleus to the stapedotomy. And because I've relocated the malleus, you can measure it in the same way from, as, from the incus, but with an elongated measuring rod, which goes, runs from five to uh, eight. This is a torque that I designed with a Grace Medical with a hydroxyl appetite head and a central groove and a 0.4 millimeter uh, diameter Teflon shaft. So it's an easy technique. You just cut the prosthesis and you introduce the shaft and then the malleus within the groove. And then finally, I'm always looking for a vertical position of the prosthesis and looking for the round window sign. Um, Sometimes, but I'm not, I don't like to use it too much. I use uh, the same technique but with uh, a Teflon prosthesis, a loop with, with crimp around the malleus. You can use it. It's a nice technique, but the problem with this is that the Teflon sometimes is not very well tolerated by the tympanic membrane. And I've seen cases of erosion of the malleus handle or at least reaction of the tympanic membrane, which I think is not really good. But if you do this, what I do is a, a very small gap between the, the tympanic membrane and the malleus handle, approximately at the middle part of the malleus like this. So with a needle, you just separate uh, here the tympanic membrane, and then you can place the loop. Uh, of course, the shaft is in, within the stapedotomy, and then I'm going to place the loop around the malleus and, uh, and then crimp uh, the, the procedure in the same way. In the past, we got uh, the same type of total Teflon prosthesis, uh, total Teflon uh, a piston, but with, uh, with an opening at 11, which was more easy than at, at, at uh, yes, at 11, but this is 9, but it's, it's, it's all right. Now, the other problem is the malus incus ankylosis, which is quite a rare disease. It could be an immediate failure if the previous surgeon uh, just missed the uh, problem of the malus ankylosis, which is only uh, less than 1% of cases in my series, uh, but uh, it can happen in revision, of course. And in that case, again, as we were talking this morning, you learn from uh, your experience in life and you have to make a difference to diagnosis. So you need to make the right diagnosis. This needs a hip replacement, of course, and not other thing. Uh, I must say, I've been many times in India, and all my friends, you've seen this video before. It's, but I think it's really funny, and it goes clearly to the message I want to give you. So making the right diagnosis. Uh, in this case, for example, let's do what we have. I have a, a nice position of the prosthesis, which uh, a bending sign, but it's fixed now. The malleus is fixed completely, so I will apply the same thing uh, with the malleus relocation technique. Uh, and in this case, it's just to show you that the malleus relocation technique can be used even in case of epitympanic malleus ankylosis. So I'm cutting now the tentor tympani, and you can see the large gap. If you don't reduce this gap, you have to bend the prosthesis uh, more anterior, and there is a higher risk of dislocation, in my opinion. You see. The malleus now is stick to the tympanic membrane, and then I will recreate a fenestration through the uh, perlymphatic membrane. Um, you see again, an 0. always a 0.7 millimeter diameter um, uh, diamond dust bar with, of course, uh, the micro drill. And I really like to see the fluid and to be sure that we have a clear connection to the labyrinth followed by vein graft and torp, as you just saw before. And again, because you have relocated the malleus, you don't care anymore about the position. You just place the prosthesis and then introduce the malleus within the groove, I would say easily, uh, after having performed that. 
so again, to prevent this problem, you need to, my opinion is that we need to separate the increase from the state piece first, prior ma uh, making the uh, um, articular chain uh, mobility assessment. So I'm using a joint knife here to gently separate the joint, and then only then I will check the mobility. Otherwise, you sometimes cannot make the difference between malleus ankylosis and stapes ankylosis when the malleus is strongly fixed. It makes like a lever effect with uh, pushing the, uh, uh, the stapes down, and you can have a false impression. So if you do primary, if you remove the stapes, then you will find still malleus fixation with the mobile stapes, which is not a good solution. Uh, any other uh, problem could be the problem of perilymphatic fistula. If we have fistula, it's clear that we need to reoperate the patient. Sometimes we have a dead ears, which means it's, it's, it's not a real problem to make the decision. And sometimes you have a perfect hearing, complete closure of the airborne gap, but the patient complains for vertigo and clearly has got a, a clear ver a a fistula sign. So in that case, you really have to go back for surgery. Um, and the problem is that we always need to identify clearly and expose clearly the uh, perinephatic fistula to then clearly cover it to seal the labyrinth. So in this case, we have a right here, and you see that we can see a little bit of fluid coming out, but that it's not possible to see the position of the uh, fistula. Uh, so I remove here the, the prosthesis, and I try to identify, and you see the fluid coming out here now, and I need to clean all this area to be sure that I will be able to place a new vein graft in this, a vein graft in this case. There was no interposition made by the previous surgeon. You see also a dislocation here of the, of the stapes. So the previous surgeon did this dislocation with, uh, uh, so I'm using now a, a clear uh, interposition with the vein, uh, which is connected then, of course, to the residual uh, foot plate and then I will place uh, a prosthesis again. But of course, if it's a dead ear, I will not put any prosthesis. So to avoid this problem of perinephatic fistula, I really believe that the vein graft helps a lot. I had exactly eight cases in my experience of postoperative fistula with personal series. That was at the beginning of my experience. Um, and when I revised them, because I had the chance to revise all of them, I found that the vein was not clearly placed here, and the fistula occurred all the time from the anterior part of the other window, which means that I was making a mistake by not covering nicely and efficiently the whole part of the foot plate. Uh, we learn from mistake, of course, much more than from our good results. And so since now, I, I, as you can see, I spend a lot of time to stretch the vein correctly. The adventitial side should face the foot plate and should stick the foot plate because this is the sticky side. So that is the preventive point. Um, now let's talk a little bit and quickly about the results because I think it's more interesting to talk about the technique itself. So that was the series I made uh, last year and we had uh, one, more than 1,000 revision K, which is pretty interesting because when we have a huge series like this, clearly you can study a lot of items which could influence the results. You have to understand that I put all my patients on the database that some of you know, which is called Autology Neurotology Database. So I do a prospective study all the time of my patient. So I enter all the preoperative points, including, of course, the audiometric test before, and I also include, enter uh, some data immediately after each surgery. It's quite an easy and simple and quick procedure. And each time I see the patient post-op at six months, one year, five, 10 years, I enter the post-op results, including complication and so on. So which means that I've got all, all details inside and I can study each detail pr prospectively. And that was helping me a lot when I was trying to introduce new techniques, just like the malice relocation technique, the stylistic bending technique in ossicular reconstruction. And when I was also uh, presenting a, a new prosthesis, like uh, I show some of them and, and later on today, but you need to see your results. Otherwise, if you don't want to see your results, you don't know exactly if you have good results or failure and you cannot identify the cause of failure and you cannot improve. So that was the series and in terms of uh, results, uh, in terms of post-operative airborne gap, of course, it's not, definitely not as good as the primary. But still, we have 55% of success rate within 10 dB, which means that it's 
clear for me that uh, revision is a clear indication all the time. But you need to know, of course, that by the results will not be the same, but the result will be clearly influenced by the cause of failure. That is the main factor. And you saw that 2.2% of uh, central neural hearing loss compared to 0.7 in my primary series. I'm not talking about dead ear, I'm talking about the whole cases of century no hearing loss post -op. This was the publication I made on this series of revision stapedotomy that was made in 2010, uh, so over uh, 600 cases. And you will see that on otology and otology. The audiometry, in turn, the, the, the thing is, um, which is much more interesting, is to study the results according to some factors. I'm always thinking about being preventive and try to preoperatively identify the patient uh, who will lead to uh, easy, probably easy uh, cause of failure, more easy to treat rather than difficult case. It's not easy, but you can get some information pre-op and, and specifically also per-op to determine exactly what could be the results. So it, it's, it's interesting to determine what was the previous type of surgery uh, and I could know that in more than 500 cases. You need to know the number of pre previous operations. That is influencing the results also. And it's not always easy to know. When the patient has been operated several times, he sometimes do not remember how many, how many times he has been operated. And the most interesting thing is when you try, try to study uh, the results uh, of revision following a primary surgery, which means what I call a first revision. In that case, it's more uh, accurate because you can clearly study the details, you can study the, 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 the influence of the previous surgeon, which means that you study your own failure and you can exactly know how you failed and what, what you did wrong. The time of failure is a major point. And these are, of course, the information that you can get easily because you know by yourself who operated, you are the other one. The time of failure is usually uh, a quite easy item to determine. The patient do remember if he never got any results, I call immediate failure. It's over six months, I would say. And uh, it's completely different than the, the patient who said that they had good results and then a long-term failure. That is completely different and that is leading to different cause of failure in my experience, clearly. This is a new study uh, with statistically study to, to determine the cause of failure. The previous technique, these two, of course, are shown or studied during the revision. These are pre-op points, and these are per-op points. So let's go for uh, the, uh, the success rate I had in my 625 cases in 2010. According to the previous type of surgery, I was able to know that in 538 cases. And following primary surgery, of course, you can see that it goes up to more than 60% of success rate within 10 dB. And uh, in when it's following revision, it goes down, of course. And that's an important point. So this is why you have to know that before by asking this to your patient. And according to the number of pre previous operations, of course, you can understand that the more the patient has been operated before, the less the success rate will be. And this is a tendency we can see here. And it also includes the risk of sensory neural hearing loss. Um, the other point is the... Uh, now. Uh, following the previous surgeon also is the same. When, when now I'm selecting only the revision following primary surgery. As I said, this is more accurate. And the first point is the previous surgeon. So we've got more than 400 cases. This is the personal revision series. This is the other surgeon revision. And interestingly, I got better results when I was doing revision following another surgeon than myself. So I don't know why. Uh, the second point is still following primary surgery, the time of failure. This is a major point because uh, this is a question that can ask your patient. And yet you can cross this information to the one you find perioperatively. This is what I did. And this is I can make a correlation between the time of failure and the cause of failure. And the long-term failure are more related to increased erosion. It's clear, rather than short-term failure, which are more related to malus ankylosis, but very rarely, short prosthesis or dislocated prosthesis, not clearly crimped. In those cases, except the malus ankylosis, it's a simple cause of failure to treat, so we've got a better chance of success. And you see that the best is, if, is of course, when you have an immediate failure or short-term failure compared to the long-term. 
Um, the other thing is following the technique itself. Of course, if it was a mobilization, then you can find an intact foot plate. It's just like doing this on a primary. So apart this point, you see that there's no major difference, but uh, if the foot plate is intact, usually it gives better results. Then, and there's no difference between stapedotomy and stapedectomy, and I'm not surprised in that. Like, there's no difference in terms of interposition or not interposition. I, I strongly believe that the, the interposition doesn't change anything in terms of success rate. It changed myself to be sure that I'm sealing the labyrinth, but not in terms of closure of the airborne gap. Uh, according to the previous technique, uh, we said that, so now we go to the next one. And now, uh, quite a long one, according to the cause of failure, um, and of course that we find again that if it's uh, related to mobilization, it's clearly a success rate, a high success rate, rather than that the worst one is dislocated incus or eroded or malleus ankylosis because it's more difficult to get exactly the right distance sometimes from the malleus to the stapedotomy. Uh, so I think it's an important point to, to know. Uh, well, I think it's, it's finished. Thanks very much. Duplicate. Yeah, that's what I do. Uh, uh, let's go and duplicate. Uh, let's check out what the other solution is. Thank you. 
Surgery, University of Hospital of Antwerp and Professor of Neuromodulation and Neurosurgery in Antwerp. Since February 2013, he is the Neurological Foundation Professor of Neurosurgery at the Department of Surgical Sciences, Dundin, School of Medicine, University of Otago, New Zealand. He has many first to his credit, including doing a primary auditory cortex implant, 14 meters, doing a amicular hippocampal implant for tinnitus and a C2 implant for tinnitus. He also has several patents to his credit. I invite Dr. Dirk D. Reader for his presentation on pulsatile tinnitus. We request Dr. Giri Raj, Professor and Hattori, Department of ENG, MES Medical College, Perugamana, to hand over the class and the pulmonary as a token of our appreciation. I request Dr. Dirk D. Rida to proceed in the middle. Indian Society of Orthology is pleased to recognize Dr. Dirk D. Rida as a life member.
Right. And this oh, is yeah. just forward, huh? That's just forward. Okay. Good afternoon. Sorry for the technical delay. And that's the New Zealand computers, which are not uh, the same as uh, local ones. So I'm, uh, I'm not an otologist, I'm a neurosurgeon. And I will talk about the uh, auto-neurosurgical management of uh, pulsatile tinnitus. As you all know, um, pulsations that we have in our brain and neck occur in the normally um, functioning auditory system and they're suppressed or otherwise we would constantly hear our pulsations probably by a mechanism in the cochlear nucleus but also by the venous plexus which uh, surround uh, some of the important um, arteries intracranially. Now, when pulsa pulsations are caused probably by a turbulent flow in abnormal blood vessels, as we all know, in stenos, blood vessels, in AVMs, or, or dural fistulas, and these are transmitted by bone uh, conduction, but bone conduction is, is actually also mediated by, by a CSF pathway, which means that you can get information um, that you can perceive pulsations even from very distal um, areas. The mastoids themselves seem to function as a resonator, just like, a, like when you have a guitar. Um, and when you have extensive pneumatization, then you can have subjective pulsatile tinnitus, even if you only have normal blood vessels, because the vibrations of them are transmitted to the, um, to directly to the cochleus, analogous, analogous to what you have in a cochlear um, dehiscence. Now, the same applies to a divert, um, diverticulum, which with a massive pneumatization can actually just um, cause you to perceive those um, pulsations. And this can occur even if small diverticula, if they're associated with a dominant uh, sinus. And these can, of course, sometimes be treated either endovascularly or surgically. And those diverticula might actually be caused by osteoporosis, and if you treat them, you can even get some improvement in hearing. Now, the same applies to uh, what you know a lot better than me as a neurosurgeon, the semicircular canal dehiscence, but what is interesting is that actually pulsatile tinnitus in 10 to 15% of those patients can be the sole uh, symptom. So that's why if you treat pulsatile tinnitus, you also have to look at it because it can be the sole system of a semicircular canal dehiscence. Now, if this concept of bone versus CSF transmission is correct, then you would hypothesize that if you have a vascular loop inside the meatus, that the sound can be transmitted to, um, to the tip and then directly to the cochlea, and that you could perceive that as pulsatile heartbeat synchronous tinnitus. So in order to know whether this was just a fantasy or reality, we actually looked at uh, 63 ears where, uh, in patients who had unilateral pulsatile tinnitus and who had non-pulsatile tinnitus. And when you had a vascular loop in pulsatile tinnitus, in an intermediate loop, then basically that meant that, you, that that could be one of the potential explanations of this um, ipsilateral heartbeat synchronous tinnitus. So, to, um, because we had done the study, I thought, well, what if we drill open the internal meatus, find the artery, and then just do a microvascular decompression like we do for um, the rest of the, um, of the patients who I try to treat with um, uh, microvascular decompression for tinnitus, which is another story in itself. Now, after, if you drill open the internal meatus, then that's not good. Yeah, it will start. It'll start by itself. I just wanted to forward it. So, here we go again. If you drill open the internal meatus, and just like uh, basically um, auto surgeons should not be scared of the brain, neurosurgeons should not be scared of the bone. Um, and you find, you cut away the last part of the dura, then you can look for the vascular compression in, intramiatally, and then once you've found that um, compression, then you can go and put some Teflon in between the blood vessel and the tip of the, um, the end of the meatus, so that those pulsations cannot go 
to the, um, to the cochlea directly. So here we take some shredded Teflon. This is Teflon that you shred uh, because a big piece will be too stiff. And then basically um, you also put it in between the blood vessel and the nerve, uh, not just trying to fill up the tip of the, um, of the cochlea. So we've uh, done four of those patients, and in uh, all four immediately the tinnitus was gone. Unfortunately, in two of them, the tinnitus did recur. So this suggested at least that this concept that pulsations can go via CSF might be correct. And what about then if you have, you have a connection, the cochlear aqueduct, between the, the scala tympani and, uh, and the intracranial portion, what if you would have a, a compression there? Then theoretically you would expect that trans pulsations are also transmitted. And if you have a patient um, like that, where you see a blood vessel very close to the uh, more detail, very close to the cochlear aqueduct, then you can try and decompress them just like you would do a, a vascular decompression, but here you decompress the cochlear aqueduct uh, in a patient who had left-sided pulsatile and non-pulsatile tinnitus, and after the decompression, which you can do he see here via a retrosigmoid approach, and this is the Teflon that you can see, uh, basically the pulsatile tinnitus resolved, but the non-pulsatile uh, tinnitus remained, and immediately on the, on the first post-operative day, he did have a 20 to 30 decibel um, hearing worsening. So apart from um, these, there is multiple surgically treatable causes for tinnitus. There's also uh, for non-pulsatile, but I'll talk only about pulsatile, where the most important ones are the benign intracranial hypertension, the Chiari malformation, and the high jugular bulb, which we see most commonly, but also uh, the ones I referred to earlier on. And then you've got the arterial um, causes, uh, where the carotid stenosis, extracranial and intracranial, the glomus tumor, uh, vascular lesions, AVMs or uh, dural fistulas, even aneurysms, if they're in the wrong location, microvascular compressions and benign intracranial hypertension, uh, which can cause both arterial and venous pulsatile tinnitus, but also some other um, pathological anomalies can lead to pulsatile tinnitus. So the most common cause is actually benign intracranial hypertension for, uh, and it's often a mixture of a venous hum and heartbeat synchronous um, arterial tinnitus is uh, most common in obese women with headache, blurry vision, pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, the venous hum disappears on compressing the ipsilateral jugular vein, which is very suggestive that it is uh, related to that. Um, CT scan is often normal, but on MRI you can see an empty cell and there is some other um, more specific signs that you can look at. Uh, if you do a lumbar puncture, the pressure should theoretically be above 20. However, we have treated patients with, um, I, with uh, ICPs which were 17 and 18, and I'll come back to that. The first treatment for this entity is weight loss, um, Lasix, uh, we give Diamox. Um, and then ultimately you can consider uh, VP shunt. These are the first patients that we decompressed um, and we try, we'd give them a trial for one week for Lasix, Diamox and Indocid and what you can see is that consistently they, these patients responded to, to, um, to uh, furosemide so we don't test these other anymore. We do a lumbar puncture and if we remove 40 cc's of um, CSF and if that improves then we go ahead with implanting a ventricular peritoneal shunt. And if you look at the loudness level before and after, and, um, and the distress level before and after, they seem to improve on the selection criteria of a response to, um, to, to furosemide, followed by lumbar puncture. And in that, if that works, we put in um, a controllable shunt so that we can control the settings. Of course, benign intracranial hypertension can be the result of a sinus stenosis, which could, which could be stented rather than be shunted if that is the cause of the um, benign intracranial hypertension associated um, with pulsatile tinnitus. And pulsatile tinnitus, just like in a, can a superior canal dehiscence, can be the only symptom, and it can be even unilateral in patients with benign intracranial hypertension. Now, any kind of uh, hypertension in the posterior fossa, such as the Chiari malformation or overcrowding if the tonsils are not um, really uh, low, can, have, um, can be associated with tinnitus. Uh, it can be both non-pulsatile and pulsatile. And it, de and it usually de uh, disappears after you do posterior fossa decompression. The pulsatile tinnitus is predominantly venous, hum, but can also be uh, sometimes heartbeat synchronous. 
Um, the hypothesis is that it is related just like a benign intracranial hypertension um, to, um, to an increased uh, pressure. It's usually worse on bending over or Valsalva maneuvers and it also disappears when you compress the ipsilateral jugular vein. And interestingly, the hearing also improves if you uh, compress the ipsilateral jugular vein. It does not, is not associated with um, ABR changes. Whereas the non-pulsatile tinnitus can and should be intermittent, and if it is intermittent, then it could actually be a, a microvascular compression, because if there is less space in the posterior fossa, just statistically the chances of a compression are higher, and then you find the typical ABR changes of a 1-3 prolongation, um, a peak 2 decrease, a, a contralateral 3-5 uh, prolongation, and often an IPL 1-3 prolongation. An, another cause of a venous, um, a venous pulsatile tinnitus can be, in, can be a, um, a high jugular bulb, which can, of course, be uh, treated surgically as well. There are other causes which I've mentioned before, uh, this, uh, the, the diverticula that you can see, um, ab, uh, the hissant jugular, uh, his, jugular veins, uh, transverse stenosis, which can cause benign intracranial hypertension and uh, can therefore initially be venous and then you get an arterial component associated with it. Now arterial causes, of course, you know better than I uh, do some of these, a glomus tumor, which if the patient is old and you don't want to operate, just embolizing, can solve the often very disturbing pulsatile tinnitus and because they're very slow growing, you could wait and see if this is the predominant cause of the patient. Dural arterial venous fistula can be, um, can be embolized just as a treatment for the pulsatile tinnitus. But you can also have actually carotid stenosis in the neck, which is the second most frequent uh, cause, where stenosis can cause the pulsatile tinnitus, which of course has to be heartbeat synchronous. And then when you compress the, the um, um, artery just digitally, then the tinnitus should disappear. You can then confirm it um, in the same session as you tend with a balloon occlusion and under uh, local anesthesia, and if the patient says, my tinnitus disappears, you can go ahead and put in a stent. Now, to make it even a little more complicated, you don't need a stenosis, just a tortuous um, a part of the extra, uh, extracranial part can actually be causing tinnitus, so a pulsatile heartbeat synchronous tinnitus, ipsilateral to the side. Um, when you go in with a catheter, and you, stre and you stretch it so that the, 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 um, the turn is gone, then the tinnitus disappears. And if the tinnitus disappears, then you, uh, with the balloon occlusion, you can have the same thing. The way we tried to solve it was, um, was either put in a stent or what we preferred is to look it up with open surgery and then take uh, a Teflon that we sutured around the uh, carotid so which you can see here, so that it stretched the, um, the tinnitus with the disappearing of the pulsatile tinnitus postoperatively. Now, if, the, if there is a kink in the artery, you can also have a kink in the vein, which can in itself cause a venous hum. Um, uh, we've not done that, but it has been described that you can do the same thing for the vein. Um, you can probably not stretch it with Teflon, but you'll have to cut out a part and then do an end to um, end anastomosis. You can also have intracranial uh, carotid stenosis, such as here, um, which also disappears on compressing the um, ipsilateral carotid. The angio will be positive, and then you can do a balloon occlusion test where you uh, uh, put in a balloon. You can do simultaneously transcranial Doppler, EEG, or, or, uh, or an angio to see if you have uh, contralateral filling. And then you can put in a stent, which, which uh, will, if the balloon occlusion is positive, uh, solve the problem of the pulsatile heartbeat synchronous tinnitus. Now, the um, intracranial large aneurysms can just by the turbulence cause, um, cause pulsatile tinnitus, but even small um, petrous um, intracranial aneurysms that erodes into the cochlea can cause pulsatile tinnitus and might be best then treated by a covered stent um, on that moment. There are some other uh, more rare cases like capillary hemangiomas, uh, duplicated um, carotids, um, GSPN schwannomas or fibromuscular dis dysplasia, which is often associated with pulsatile tinnitus that um, can be treated surgically. But as I said, 
The lesion can be at a distance. For example, here is a lesion that was seen by my ENT colleagues uh, who did a biopsy and it came back as a hemangioblastoma. So what we did is we, did, we started with an endoscopic approach just to drill out this, um, this part, but uh, we had to convert to a lateral um, opening of the nose and removed the lesion, um, except for the parts that were um, actually in the cavernous sinus, and the, and the tinnitus went down on a loudness scale from A to 2, and when we, when we gave the patient hearing aids afterwards, actually the tinnitus completely um, disappeared while she was wearing them. So even lesions at a distance can be, benef can be treated by, um, as a sole indication for treating the uh, pulsatile tinnitus. So in conclusion, pulsatile tinnitus can be objective, where we can hear it with a stethoscope, um, usually associated with pathological um, vessels, but it can also be subjective, especially when you've got this big uh, pneum uh, pneumatization of your mastoids. And subjective tinnitus can, is um, related to pneumatization, but also to some of the sensory interactions, meaning predominantly interaction between your C2 nerve, so neck uh, movement related, um, and as well as, um, as hearing loss. Objective pulsatile tinnitus is linked to aberrant blood vessels, even at a, a distance. So the goal in treating pulsatile tinnitus is to first look for a cause. And if you look hard enough, in 85%, not in 100%, but in 85% of the cases, you should be able to find some, some pathology that might, be, that might explain uh, the treatment of uh, the cause of the tinnitus. Um, you can do manual occlusion tests in your office, uh, except with patients who, of course, have very bad vascular disease where you don't want to create a, a stroke. And you can do an intravascular occlusion test before you do anything permanently, which could be um, obliterating the vessel or stenting um, the vessel or resecting the lesion if, that is, um, if it is resectable. And I think in view of the fact that it can be very debilitating, and of course before patients come to see a neurosurgeon for, vascul for some kind of treatment, usually it is uh, debilitating, otherwise it would not show up. Um, I think aggressive sur surgery might be warranted uh, because it can be very um, quality of life hindering in uh, those patients. But what is, what is strictly important, I think, is that you work in a multidisciplinary team where you collaborate with autologists, neurosurgeons, and also with interventional neuroradiologists, neuro because ultimately it is one of the three or a combination of the three who will have to um, uh, solve the problem. So in summary, pulsatile tinnitus should be treatable in 85% of the cases. Um, just by looking harder, we might find some more cases, and sometimes it's a rare, um, a rare case, but ultimately, uh, many patients can benefit from surgery and pulsatile tinnitus. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. So, is there any questions from the audience? Because this is not really any challenging problems for the court or this to deal with uh, this. Thing. So, I think one or two questions can be asked because we have more time. Pardon me? Well, the f mm -hmm. well, we, we usually start with just uh, routine imaging um, of an MRI scan, uh, of course, associated with, um, with um, MR angio. Sometimes we extend it to CT angio if, if we're not 100% sure. If that does not work, um, and the patient is obese, has headaches, uh, which worsen on bending over. Now we will give the Lasix and then the lumbar puncture if the Lasix benefits. Um, if after the imaging, CT or MR angio, we think we have found a cause, then we'll do a functional um, testing with a balloon occlusion, where we just go uh, in with a catheter, and we occlude one, two, three uh, vessels, which we think might be involved, and see clinically whether under the local anesthesia, the patient says, yes, there is a benefit. Any other? 
Good. Thank you, Doctor. I request Dr. K. Vishwanathan, Senior ENT Surgeon from Caltech, to hand over the unit to the chairperson. Thank you, Doctor. For our next talk by Dr. Carl Bern Wittenbring, we invite our chairpersons Dr. Arun Goyen from New Delhi and Dr. Sandeep Atawala from Satara. Thank you. So this is, you mentioned it, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, this is the view to Drayson's Blue Wonder a part with the Elbe River. It's a little bit like, not like Kerala, we don't have the palm trees. It's cold now, it's snowing. So this is the difference like here, compared to here. So uh, we have 30 minutes to talk about osiculoplasty. And I want to take you a little bit with me to some ideas about osiculoplasty, how to improve it and how to work on it. And it's the same like I did in my oration this morning. When we start about osiculoplasty, we first of all have to understand how does nature, how does it work? And then with, from basic physiology, from working together with engineers, we try to find if we have a defect ossicular chain, we try to know how could we improve this defect or restore this defect ossicular chain by looking how it works in nature. That means there's always, the nature is always our example, our uh, the, 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 the construction which we have to follow. So first of all is the question, how do you develop new things there in middle ear? And again, it's only possible with, this, with engineers. I'm a simple auto-surgeon. I do the drilling, the burring, and the working, and I have to work together with engineers because they explain to me how it could work, and we come together and we build something. So first question is, if we have this lot amount of ossicular prosthesis, there are more than 100 different sizes, types, designs, and materials on the market. How can you choose what is the best prosthesis? What is good if, it is, if you have a new prosthesis? What is better? For example, the weight. This is the weight of different prosthesis here. It's still in German, but anyhow, it's an old, old slide, but it shows what is the difference between gold, 42, with or dentine, even titanium is not here, that's even less weight, only three, four milligrams. Is there a difference? How could you measure that? Well, you could, of course, use audiometry. And this is what is done in literature. When you look and go into your bibliotheque and you look, <clears throat> you see there are bookshelves full with new prosthesis and famous inventors, famous autosurgeons who designed their new prosthesis and they reported on the benefit of this new prosthesis, and they had the best results with this new prosthesis. Unfortunately, other surgeons who used this prosthesis didn't report the same good results. Why? What is going on? So how did they prove they have the good prosthesis? By audiometry. And of course, audiometry is the most important thing, because what we do, we want to have a better audiometry, better hearing after surgery. 
but is this a good tool for reporting or designing or, or investigating new types of prosthesis, for example, the weight, heavy weight prosthesis or lightweight prosthesis? What is the difference? Audiometry? No. You cannot, because there are so many variables influencing the result that you cannot get down to the point what is the weight, the influence of the weight of the prosthesis, because it goes under, it drowns under all this stuff of all the variables. Just one little, I put it in red here, just one little thing here, effusion. So if you put a prosthesis into an ear with effusion, and in the morning you heard what happens if there's water behind the tympanic membrane, then the sound conduction is going off, it's, it's bad. So if you have effusion there, what will happen to the result, to the acoustic result? It will be all dominated by the effusion. So what would you do to rule out if you have 100 ears with a heavy prosthesis and 100 ears with a light prosthesis? What would you do to get out all the ears with effusion, not to, to, to work with the effusion ears? What would you do? Audiometry, and then what do you do in India if you want to be sure there is no effusion behind the ear? Effusion means water behind the tympanic membrane. Do you have a tool here in India how to do it? Tympanometry, very simple. So now go into your bibliotheque and look in the literature about all these hundreds of new prosthesis